Balistan. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Later today, I will reply to the email that Jeremy Corbyn sent me yesterday asking what he should ask at Prime Minister's questions <laughs> next week. Uh, the email said that in just over two months, we've already achieved so much together. I think Jeremy Corbyn is being modest, presiding officer. He and Chairman Mao are doing much more to destroy the Labour Party than even I have managed. <laughs> Officer, alongside the Chancellor's misguided budget statement yesterday, the impartial and independent OBR published updated oil revenue figures. And it's not talking Scotland down to say that they made for grim reading. Yesterday was a significant day, but so is today. It's an important anniversary, because two years ago today, the First Minister published the White Paper on independence. In that document, the First Minister promised a future free from Tory austerity based on oil revenues of £8 billion a year at the point of independence. Can the First Minister say how much oil revenues are expected to be this year? First Minister. Well, I have to say, on the day after Labour's partners in the Better Together campaign, otherwise known as the Tories, announced plans to cut the Scottish budget in real terms in revenue budget by £1.5 billion by the end of this decade. For Kezia Dugdale to stand up and talk about cuts or anything like that is breathtaking hypocrisy, yes. presiding officer. This is, this is a, a challenging time for the oil and gas sector, which is why the task force that I established uh, earlier this year is working hard to support the industry at this time. But do you know what? Every time people hear Labour gleefully crowing about the challenges in the oil and gas sector, what they realise is how little Labour actually care about people's jobs and about their livelihoods. They realise that for Labour, for okay. Labour First Minister. all it's about is getting one over on the SNP. But you know, if Kezia Dugdale wants to cast her mind back to the pre-referendum period, then let me uh, give her something else to ruminate on. Does she remember when the Better Together parties told us before the referendum that the only way Order. to protect jobs in HMRC was to vote no? And can she explain why it is that after the referendum, the UK government announced plans to slash these jobs? Perhaps Kezia Dugdale might want to reflect on that. Kezia Dugdale. Mr. Officer, I was born in Aberdeen. I grew up in the North East. I know the damage that this industry and the communities that are affected by the decline in that gas industry is going to cause. Please do not question my motivation when I bring that subject to this chamber. Not a single person. I asked a very specific question about oil revenues, and the problem for the First Minister is that she wasn't just a wee bit wrong. She didn't tell a half-truth. She didn't even tell a quarter truth. She wasn't out by a factor of 10, 20 or 30. The SNP's oil figures were wrong by a factor of more than 60. Because according to the OBR, oil and gas revenues this year are expected to be just £130 million. President officer, the weirs won more than that on the lottery. And we know from today's oil and gas survey that things aren't going to get much better any time soon. So can the First Minister tell us where the SNP's failure lies on oil? Was it their ability to do the numbers or their ability to tell the truth? Order. First Minister. Presenting officer, the, First the Minister. hypocrisy is, I have to say, breathtaking because back in the period that Kezia Dugdale is talking about, she was in a campaign with the Conservatives and the Conservative government at the time were forecasting uh, oil prices to be even higher than was the case on the part of the Scottish Government. Now, I have to say to Kezia Dugdale, and I'm sorry to have to say this, but I do question the motivation of a party that was happy to tell Scotland to leave its finances in the hands of George Osborne to then have the cheek to stand
stand up today in the Scottish Parliament and complain about yeah. cuts. The fact of the matter is the choice facing Scotland today is the same as the choice has always been. Do we allow the Tories to control our finances or do we take control of our destiny into our own hands? I know what I prefer. Kezia Dugdale. Ms Dugdale. So the First Minister accuses me of hypocrisy. She's the one that promised a second oil boom. And it would be bad enough if the government responsible for collecting an increasingly large share of our taxes had been out by 10% or 20%. But the First Minister was out by 6,000%. 6,000%, presiding officer, on the money needed to fund our schools, our hospitals and our pensions. Now, the government's ability to get these things Order. right... The government's ability to get these things right really matters to our future, because this parliament will be responsible for more tax and spending than ever before. We will have a chance to make different choices and take a break from Tory austerity. So we can't ever again be in a position where our government's Order. numbers are so wrong on Order. such a grand scale. What we need, presiding officer, is a real financial watchdog with teeth, not the pup that John Swinney is proposing. So will the First Minister back our plan for a Scottish office for budget responsibility? First Minister. Well, as Kedia Dugdale should know if she's bothered to read the draft legislation, the Fiscal Commission will have a veto over the projections that John Swinney brings to this Parliament. But, you know, I think it says everything Scotland needs to know about the priorities of the Scottish Labour Party. That the day after George Osborne's budget, a budget that announced plans to reduce the revenue budget of this Parliament by £1.5 billion in real terms over the remainder of this decade. What does Kezia Dugdale come to this chamber and do? Does she criticise the Conservatives? No, she wants to play politics with the SNP instead. It's that, it's that approach. Order. It's that approach, Order. presiding Ms. officer being arm in arm with the Conservatives while this party stands up for Scotland that has left Labour in the doldrums. But if she, wants to know, if she wants to know some real facts about the oil and gas sector, she won't, take, she won't take my word for it. Well, let's hear what Oil and Gas UK's economics director Order. had to say just yesterday about the OBR. Oil and Gas UK believes there is room for greater optimism, given the fact that production from the industry is likely to increase this year for the first time in more than a decade and is set to continue throughout the remainder of this decade. So we in this government, presiding officer, will get on with the job of supporting the industry, of supporting the Scottish economy, of standing up for Scotland against the Conservatives, and we will leave the Labour Party to the slow, painful death that they're currently experiencing. Kezia Dugdale. Ms Dugdale. Order. If I wanted real facts about the oil and gas industry, the First Minister is the last person I would be going to for. The idea that you could have a Scotland with high public Order. spending, low taxes, a stable economy and reasonable government debt was wishful a year ago. Now it is deluded. Those aren't my words, presiding officer. They are the words of Alex Bell, the man who drafted the White House. Order. Order. Let us hear Ms Dugdale. Order. We are on the cusp of major change. With new powers heading our way, Scottish politics will never be the same again. This Parliament needs impartial, independent oversight of government finances. Scots can't be let down like this ever again. The question for the First Minister is this. With all her power, with her majority in this place and after eight years in power, is she humble enough to change her ways? First Minister. I think we'll recall... Uh, let us hear the First Minister. I think we'll recall, Presiding Officer, that it was at the recent Labour Party conference in Scotland that the word change was emblazoned across the backdrop. The only party in Scotland, apart from the Conservatives, that badly needs to change its ways is the Scottish Labour Party. But Kezia Dugdale, Kezia Dugdale quoted 
I am being heckled to say that the Lib Dems need to change the way, and I am, I am happy to concede that that too is correct, presiding officer. But, you know, Kezia Dugdale uh, quoted a former adviser uh, to the Scottish Government. I uh, often enjoy quotes from uh, former advisers to political parties. I particularly enjoyed this one from the former adviser of Kezia Dugdale, a Mr John McTernan. If Scottish Labour were a football team, it would be in Division 3 struggling to avoid relegation. That was <laughs> just before he talked about just before he talked about the stupidity of the Scottish Labour Party under Kezia Dugdale. Well, I tell you what, presiding officer, I and the SNP and this Scottish Government will continue to stand up for Scotland. We will continue to fight Scotland's corner against the Conservatives and we will leave the Labour Party to wherever it is they've ended up in Scottish politics. <laughs> Uh, to ask the First Minister when she'll next meet the Prime Minister. First Minister. Uh, I will next meet the Prime Minister on the 14th of December. Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Presenting Officer, yesterday the Chancellor unveiled the biggest home building programme since the 1970s. Responding, the House Builders Trade Body, Homes for Scotland, said its sentiment was clear to back those that aspire to buy their own home. The Chancellor also announced he'd be pushing forward with his commitment to help to buy supporting first-time buyers onto the property ladder. Homes for Scotland says this is, and I quote, in marked contrast to the position here, where the announced successor to the Scottish Government's scheme faces budget, budget reductions of up to 50% and will likely be less accessible to buyers. Will the First Minister today reverse those cuts and give a decent leg up to those aspiring to own their own home? First Minister. What an utter cheek. First Minister. What an utter cheek. For a Scottish Conservative to stand in this chamber the day after George Osborne's cuts to this Parliament's budget were announced and utter the word cuts it is absolutely unbelievable. <laughs> this, government, this government has consistently supported the Help to Buy scheme. We've done it in partnership with Homes for Scotland and we will continue to do so. John Swinney, of course, will outline our budget plans in this chamber in three weeks' time. Uh, but I've already said in the next uh, session of Parliament it will be the aim of this government, if we are re-elected, presiding officer, to build 50,000 affordable homes. We had a target of 30,000 in this Parliament, which we are more than on track to meet. But, you know, one of the things that I take issue with in terms of the plans announced by the UK government yesterday, yes, they are about building homes and I welcome that in as far as it goes, but there is no commitment, no commitment whatsoever on the part of the UK government to building new social homes for people who need to rent. And that says everything about the Tories. They're not interested in helping the poorest and the vulnerable in our society. All they're interested in doing is harming them even further. Ruth Davidson. Ms. Davidson. Presiding officer, only the SNP, only the SNP could find grievance in a 14% increase in the Scottish capital budget. Of course, if we'd listened to the First Minister's fiscal autonomy plans, we'd be sitting here with a £20 billion black hole in Scotland's finances right now. But if we get back to housing, the truth of the matter is this. The number of new homes built each year is down 40% from the time the SNP took office. 10,000 fewer homes built in Scotland. And we know now that her ministers are about to half the help to buy scheme in Scotland, ripping £65 million worth of help away from first-time buyers. In short, this SNP government is slashing support for home building and it's slashing support for home buying. Now, I know that the First Minister wants to make plenty of political points about George Osborne today. But there are thousands of people out there who are trying their best to get on the housing ladder. Why is she cutting their support? First Minister. Well, let me firstly just pick up Ruth Davidson on the point she made about the capital budget. Because, and she will be well aware of this, I'm sure, but I know she won't want the people in Scotland to hear this. Because despite the Chancellor yesterday in claiming to increase capital spending, the fact is 
that Scotland's capital budget in 2019-20, based on the plans that were announced yesterday, will be £600 million, 17 per cent lower than Scotland's capital budget was in the year that David Cameron became Prime Minister. That is the reality of the spending plans of this Conservative Government. Uh, and the the point about housing is this. We have helped thousands of people into home ownership through our Help to Buy scheme, through our Shared Equity scheme, and we will continue to provide that help. But we will also, as a government presiding officer, continue to have a commitment that the UK government no longer has. We will have a commitment to building social, affordable housing as well. That balanced, balanced housing policy that helps people across our country is the right one and it is the one this government will continue to pursue. Yeah. Yesterday the Chancellor made the disgraceful decision to pull a thousand million pound funding from the development of carbon capture and storage technology in the UK which could have created the world's first commercial scale uh, gas powered CCS plant in Peterhead. Has the Minister been in touch with the UK Government on this and does the Minister have any observations as to the effect of this on the negotiating position that the UK might have at the upcoming Paris talks on climate change? First Minister. Well, I think Stuart Stevenson is absolutely correct to describe this as a disgraceful decision. And I think it's a shocking example of how the Conservative UK government is treating businesses. You know, here we've got two FTSE 100 companies entering a £1 billion capital funding competition in good faith, committing resource, time and money towards a bid that was due at the end of this year, only to be told at the very last minute that the money is no longer available. We weren't consulted on this before this decision was announced. And actually, uh, as everybody will have uh, realised, the Chancellor actually neglected to mention uh, this in his autumn statement. We were only told afterwards. Uh, Fergus Ewing has already made clear to the UK Government our opposition to this decision, uh, which is the latest in a long list of UK Government energy decisions which harm energy generation in Scotland and, as Stuart Stevenson rightly says, ahead of the Paris talks, undermines our efforts to tackle climate change. So I would call on the UK Government today to reverse this decision because it is utter folly, it is unfair to businesses, it is downright wrong. Question, Question three, Willow Rennie. Ask the First Minister discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Willow Rennie. I agree with the, what the First Minister has just said about the carbon capture project up in Peterhead and I know that she agrees with me about the Chancellor abandoning his plans on tax credit cuts. Um, so will the First Minister agree with me on something else too? A cross-party campaign led by my Liberal Democrat colleague Norman Lamb has persuaded the Chancellor to add £600 million to mental health spending in England. Bearing in mind the news this week about child and adolescent mental health services in Grampian and Tayside, will the First Minister guarantee to use the new NHS money for mental health services here? First Minister. Well, can I uh, thank Willie Rennie for raising this issue, because I do think it is an important issue. Um, he will understand that John Swinney is due to bring forward his budget in three weeks' time, and Parliament will hear the government's spending plans in that budget, and we'll have a chance to scrutinise and debate those plans. But Willie Rennie is right to point to the importance of mental health. He will be aware that we are already committed to investing an additional £100 million over the next five years to help equip the health service to be able to provide the support and treatment that is needed. Uh, that funding will deliver a three-year programme to support the child and adolescent mental health service workforce, including further training and more specialised supervisors. It will invest money to improve mental health support in primary care and it will also support the development of innovative approaches in mental health delivery, including the provision of support uh, for people who need mental health care in community settings. We're also developing a new improvement programme, which is working with all NHS boards to identify and plan for how their performance can be improved. Uh, we're doing all of that, but I would say to Willie Rennie that I recognise the need for us always to be looking to do more, because the fact is more people today are accessing mental health services. That is a good thing, because we should encourage people to come forward, but when they do, we need to make sure that the NHS is providing the services and the treatments that they need. Willie Rennie. Uh, well, I look forward to the, to the budget in due course, because if I can gently say to the First Minister, 
We've heard an awful lot of that before, and it's simply not enough. We asked the Health Minister in June about the shocking waiting times back then. He said he had a recovery plan. But since then, it's actually got worse. 50 per cent of young people in Grampian don't get seen on time. And that rises to a staggering 70 per cent in Tayside. That's hundreds of teenagers waiting for months to get help they need urgently. So will she accept, and I hope she does, will she accept that things cannot carry on like this? And will she give an early commitment that this new NHS money will be committed to mental health? First Minister. Well, as I've said, we will bring forward our budget plans in our budget. I think that is a reasonable uh, thing to say, and Willie Rennie will, of course, have the opportunity to ask questions uh, about those spending plans uh, when John Swinney outlines them to Parliament in three weeks' time. I mean, I, I, I'm trying to be uh, consensual here because I think it is an important issue, and I am determined that the plans that we have set out and the plans that we set out in future uh, will be commensurate to the scale of the challenge that we face. Uh, Willie Rennie, uh, talked rightly about a number of health boards that are facing significant challenges and we're establishing an improvement team to work with them uh, to address those challenges. Uh, I won't repeat what I've said uh, in my previous answer about the money that we have committed already over the next five years, uh, but we are seeing uh, some progress towards what we need to achieve here. So in the last year, for example, we've seen a 4.5% increase in CAMS clinical staff, uh, and since 2009, the CAMS workforce has increased by more uh, than a quarter. Uh, so these are the steps we need to take and we need to make sure that we continue to have uh, the capacity in place in our health boards to meet the increase in demand for mental health services that the country is facing. Question number four, Kenneth Gibson. Richardson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the impact on Scotland will be of the combined autumn statement and comprehensive spending review. First Minister. Spending review represents a continuation of the UK Government's failed austerity programme. Um, as a result of the UK Government's cuts, funding for day-to-day -day public services in Scotland will be cut by almost 6% over the next four years. That represents a cut of over £1.5 billion in real terms. Uh, I think these further cuts are damaging, they are needless, and they will continue to hit the poorest hardest. What is to be welcomed uh, from yesterday's statement is the Chancellor's U-turn over tax credits. This is a change that we repeatedly called for. A few weeks ago, I, in this chamber, called on people to unite to persuade the Chancellor to change its mind. Uh, however, notwithstanding that U-turn, the cuts to the welfare budget are set to continue, uh, and we will want to scrutinise very carefully uh, where the axe from these cuts is going to fall. Kenneth Gibbs. I thank the First Minister for her answer. She will know that last May the Tories obtained their lowest share of the vote in Scotland since 1865. Does the First Minister therefore agree that whilst it makes no economic sense for the Tories to impose further austerity cuts on an unwilling Scotland that will only damage this Parliament's ability to grow our economy and deliver services, it also shows their contempt for Scottish democracy? First Minister. Well, I saw a, a flicker of memory on Jackson Carlaw's face there at the mention of 1865. I think he's probably the only <laughs> member of the, the Tory benches that still remembers the, the heyday of, of the Scottish Conservatives. But... <laughs> The member, I, th I think I just woke Mr. Carlo up there, actually, presiding <laughs> officer. Uh, if, I, if, if, if the look on his face, the Tories are going back to 1865, is what Jackson Carlo has just shouted at me across the chamber. Some of us think they went there rather a long time ago. Anyway, back to the important point. Uh, the member, I do, I do think, raises an important point. Rather than supporting economic growth and prosperity. Uh, the Chancellor's cuts will undermine the measures this government has taken to support households and businesses. So we will continue to do everything within our power to protect the most vulnerable uh, from these austerity measures. And that will very much be our focus as we draw up spending plans ahead of the Scottish Budget next month. Jackie Bailey. And I welcome the Chancellor's U-turn on tax credits, but the First Minister has said that the Scottish Government will mitigate against UK austerity measures. There are, of course, new powers coming to the Parliament. So can she tell us, as George Caravan was unable to do today, of any specific measures she will take to combat Tory austerity? First Minister. Well, we will bring forward our proposals uh, firstly in our budget and then we will bring forward proposals in our manifesto. Hopefully Labour will do the same thing. But let me tell Jackie Bailey what this government is already doing uh, to mitigate Tory welfare cuts. We are spending £104 million yeah. 
this year to make sure nobody has to pay the bedroom tax. Interestingly, Labour in Wales is not making sure nobody has to pay the bedroom tax. We are we set up the Scottish Welfare Fund. We're supporting advice agencies to give people the advice that they need. So this government will continue to do everything we can to help the most vulnerable in the face of further cuts from the Conservatives. And we'll leave Jackie Bailey over the next few months to continue to argue that instead of investing in our public services, in our economy, in support for the vulnerable, we should be spending £167 billion on Trident nuclear weapons. She seems to be in a minority of one in her own benches these days, which says it all about the stupidity of the position she takes. Murdo Fraser. Can the uh, First Minister tell us what level of budget cuts would we now be facing had we followed the SNP's policy of full fiscal autonomy? First Minister. I mean, you know, what can you say to the hypocrisy really knows no bounds? Can I just remind, can I just remind the Chamber of what Murdo Fraser and all his colleagues on the Tory and the Labour benches said before? the referendum. Remember, we had to vote no to protect welfare. Now £12 billion has been cut from the welfare budget. We had to vote no to protect Scotland's budget. Yesterday, 6% real terms cuts to the Scottish revenue budget over the remainder of this decade. Okay. So I will continue to make the case, presiding officer, that it is better to control our own resources with independence than it ever will be to leave our resources in the hands of Murdo Fraser and his colleagues. Question five, Neil Findlay. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will hold an inquiry into undercover police operations in Scotland. First Minister. Uh, the Office of Surveillance Commissioners, which carries out annual inspections of Police Scotland undercover activities, hasn't ever raised an issue with Scottish Ministers. Uh, the Scottish Government take all allegations of police impropriety seriously, and should there be evidence of such activity, then I can assure this Chamber that appropriate action will be taken. And of course, the Government has already taken a range of action to ensure strong safeguards are in place regarding undercover activity. Neil Finlay. The Home Secretary, Theresa May, has established the Pitchford Inquiry to examine the role of undercover policing in England and Wales since 1968. Mm -hmm. As policing has devolved, Scotland is not included in the inquiry. Given yesterday's revelations about Police Scotland's monitor monitoring of journalists and their sources, and the Sunday Herald's weekend expose of Mark Kennedy, an undercover officer who monitored environmental activists at the G8 summit at Glen Eagles, there is now growing concern about the role of undercover police past and present. Is the First Minister seriously, seriously telling us that under a Tory Home Secretary there will, be, there will be an inquiry in England, but under her leadership the truth and justice will not be offered to victims in Scotland? First Minister. Well, the difference, the difference uh, is this, which actually I'm, I'm pretty sure Neil Finlay knows uh, about. Uh, Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary for England and Wales produced a report in 2013 which recommended actions to ensure strong safeguards are in place regarding undercover uh, activity. Um, but the Office of Surveillance Commissioners carries out annual inspections of Police Scotland's activity in relation to undercover investigation and has never raised an issue either directly with Scottish ministers or through its annual report about Police Scotland or indeed about the legacy forces in relation to undercover activity. So if these uh, concerns are raised with us, of course we will act appropriately and of course we will carefully consider the conclusions of the Pitchford inquiry uh, and if there are measures which could sensibly be delivered in Scotland we will discuss with Police Scotland and other interested stakeholders how they might best be implemented. Question number six, Rod Campbell. It's doing to eradicate abuse of patients in care homes. First Minister. Well, no care home resident should ever be subject to any form of harm or abuse, and it should be remembered that the vast majority of care homes deliver high-quality care to their residents. The Care Inspector investigates complaints against registered care homes and carries out a rigorous inspection programme. Complaints about registered social service workers are investigated by the Scottish Social Services Council. Through our current uh, health bill, we are legislating to bring forward a new offence of willful neglect, and that will provide uh, improve current powers and complaints procedures and ensure effective legal action can be taken against a care worker or a care provider wherever necessary. Roderick Campbell. 
thank the First Minister for that answer. Ronald Mayer, Chief Executive of Scottish Care, is reported to have said that the rise in abuse allegations referred to in an article in Sunday Post might be down to a greater awareness of how to report issues. Notwithstanding this, does the First Minister agree that abuse in any circumstances cannot be tolerated and that the increased frailty and demands of care home residents demands a workforce that is better trained, skilled and paid? First Minister. I absolutely agree with that. I completely agree that ab abuse in any circumstances cannot be tolerated and Mr. will not Simpson, be tolerated. Stop shouting across the chamber, First Minister. Should it occur, I have made clear and we will continue to make clear that we expect employers, the Care Inspectorate and the Scottish Social Services Council to take a very firm approach. Improving workforce skills and recruiting and retaining the right people is absolutely essential to that. These are key areas for action in the vision and strategy for social services in Scotland and we're also uh, working with the SSSC to achieve the full rollout of regulation of care workers and a range of partners to uh, further progress fair work practices across the care sector. Thank you. That ends First Minister's questions. We are now moving to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.